Coming from Mark, the ninth chapter, verses 23 and 24, with our main focus coming from verse 24. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And I would also like to read that very same passage and verses from the Amplified Bible. Verse 23, and Jesus said, you say to me, if you can do anything, why? All things can be possible or are possible to him who believes. Verse 24, at once the father of the boy gave an eager piercing, inarticulate, cry with tears. And he said, Lord, I believe constantly. Help my weakness of faith. Help my weakness of faith from the Amplified and from the King James. Help thou my unbelief. And today for a topic, I want to use the topic that I've been hearing in my spirit Crisis intervention. Crisis intervention. And many of us who have heard that term and terminology through the years, we know that that term crisis intervention means a lot. We know that it's very substantial because many lives have been saved and transformed. Many people have been brought out of dangerous situations because of crisis intervention and today we're going to be looking and talking about crisis intervention and what that means for a spirit-filled believer in jesus christ and we just welcome you today to our weekly telebroadcast and we pray that you are blessed by the word of the lord on today to pray and just momentarily we're going to jump right into the word of the lord that the that god has given us for today. Amen. So let us pray. Father, we thank you through the precious name of Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the holy one, the one who is sitting at your right hand, the one in who all power, authority, and might, and dominion, and majesty rules and reigns and resides with. God, you told him to sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And Father, we thank you for Jesus, that powerful name, that powerful name whereby at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow in both heaven and earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, all power and authority is given and there is no salvation aside from the name of Jesus Christ. That name we lift up today and we lift it up to you because he is the major, major crisis, crisis manager that we have ever seen. And we thank you for his intervention in our lives from delivering us from death, ushering us into life eternal forevermore. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We're so grateful unto the Lord that we have opportunity to share the word of the Lord with you. And as mentioned, our primary focal verse will be verse 24, although verse 23 is a key to what we're where we're going today. Amen. The word of the Lord says, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. For those of you that may not know the background of this particular instance in scripture, the father has a son who is being tossed into the fire by a demonic spirit. And for days on end, the father has watched this child suffer at the desire and at the will of the backing of this particular spirit. 
the father is actually powerless to do anything about this. And because of the fact that he is so powerless to do anything about this, he makes an attempt and he comes to Jesus' disciples asking them if they have the power and the ability to cast this spirit out of this boy. But they found in their instance when attempting to do so that they were actually powerless to actually be able to handle this. The father in his desperation sees Jesus coming and the first thing he does, he knows the power, heard of the reputation of Jesus Christ and he cries out, Lord, help thou me. He cries out in such a way and in scripture and, and verse 22 it says and oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into water into the waters to destroy him and if thou canst do anything have compassion on us and help us <clears throat> at the heart of intervention there is help there is rescue there is one or a group of people or a set of guidelines, rules, and, and establishment, and medical professionals, and, and psychological professionals, and ministry professionals, and those that are part of our families, those that are part of our congregation, those who are in ministry have intervened in the life of someone who was experiencing a crisis, whether that crisis was the death of a loved one, whether that crisis was the loss of a home or the separation or divorce of a spouse, whether that was the loss of a child, whether it was the loss of employment or income, whether that was the loss of friendships and many other things and, and, and the integrity of one's health or even their mental capacity. There is oftentimes where we need someone to intervene in our lives to help us through devastating situation through trials through the vicissitudes of life and and those things that propose to be a challenge to us and those things that stop us dead within our tracks from progressing normally and progressing with peace and progressing with integrity and soundness in our hearts and in our minds but yet the spirit of the lord says in the time when the enemy comes in like a flood it's the spirit of the lord that lifts up a standard against him and oftentimes through these crisis situations we lose sleep we lose hope we lose faith in god and we begin to look at life completely differently and diverse away from the thinking that God would have us to think, not knowing oftentimes that he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards us, thoughts to prosper us, thoughts to bring us into perfect helping, and also he knows our end. But we lose focus of those things when we're going through a devastating crisis situation. Now, how devastating a crisis is depends upon one's own psychology and their own thinking and their wherewithal. Some people can handle much. To whom much is given, much is required. And some people, can they have very little uh, capacity to, to go through challenges. The loss of a boyfriend or, or, a, or a loved one that they've only known for a couple of days can be devastating to them. Some people who have been in a 30-year marriage only to find out that their spouse no longer is in love with them and have made the decision to move on can be most devastating. We know that some of us have gone through the housing foreclosure that, that happened a few years ago with the downward spiral of our economy. Many people lost their homes and, and were forced to start over again, not as homeowners but as renters. Some even went through a period of time where they were homeless or sleeping in their cars or living with family members, losing all of their earthly possessions because of someone's vicious mindset to gain profit and, and create contracts that were less than favorable on the side of the consumer. We've gone through crisis situations. Some of us have gone through crisis even in our own local assembly. Some of us as pastors have seen people leave our congregation. Some of us have seen the loss of our facilities. Some of us have seen people mar our reputation and take our reputation through the mud. And now we have people that are talking about us in a very adverse, negative situation. We have seen devastation. 
We have experienced the frustrations that have come through those devastating moments and situations. Knowing one thing that we were trying to get our lives back together and get back on the right track, but it's been a long road to get there. And it's been filled with, with challenges along the way, hurdles and potholes and dips and twists, twists and dives and highs and lows and more lows than highs. And many of us are having a very difficult time navigating through extreme situations. We need a crisis intervention. We need someone to help us through those challenging moments to navigate those thick woods and, and those high grasses and, and those things that, that tend to foster an atmosphere of disbelief and, and distrust and, and, and wanting to walk away from God and toss in the towel and say that I had enough of him because of all these things. Why did God allow all these devastating situations to occur? And even though this is a television broadcast and also it will be, will be appearing on YouTube, I can feel in my spirit that I'm picking up some riders here that are dealing with devastating life challenges and are trying to feel their way through it. But feel in the midst of the situation that God has turned a deaf ear We've gone to those who are in ministry. We've gone to counselors. We've gone to doctors. And with the attempt and the ability to help us. But we feel like that woman with the issue of blood. Who has spent their time and energy on those things that they thought would help. And they have wasted valuable resources as a matter of fact. But yet, there is no reprieve. Even when we speak the words to ourselves, physician, heal thyself. We feel no relief. In some cases, many of us are praying all day, all night. Some of us have even gone as far as turning our plates down before the Lord. And still, there is no change. We are still in the midst of our crisis situation. And even those that we've gone to in ministry, our coverings, our peers, those who are in elevated positions, and we've gone to them with a concern in our hearts, in our minds, and in our spirit, and we unloaded and released ourselves with hoping to receive some reprieve that they, they would have answers, and, and they provided answers, but even in the midst of their ministry, even in the midst of their encouragement, even in the midst of them laying on of hands and having a prayer team circle us and pray for us and anoint us with oil, still... We're in crisis mode, and the answer has not come. We have spent our days and times on our faces before the Lord, laying out prostrate, and we have consumed a diet of the word, but still, we're in crisis mode with no intervention. We have repeated the word of the Lord tirelessly. We have anointed ourselves with oil. We have fasted. We have prayed. We have consecrated. We have gone to every service that we can imagine to go to. We have even followed the prophetic utterance and voices of people who have obviously spoke to us either correctly by the Spirit of the Lord or those who have spoken out of their own flesh. We have sowed seed after seed. We have placed checks in the offering plate, believing that God would hear it, and we even named it only to walk away weeks on end without an answer from the Lord God Almighty. We're still embroiled in our crisis situations. We have cried. We have watered our pillows we have gone to work with that frustration in our hearts and worn a smile, but yet at the same time, there is a spirit that is after us 
to rob us of our peace, to rob us of our sleep, to rob us of our joy, to rob us of our relationship with the Lord, and no one has come to our aid or to our rescue. My God. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ. Just imagine, if you will, for a few moments with me, the pain of this father's heart. Seeing his son, and the Bible doesn't tell us whether or not he has any other children, but because of this child who has come from his loins, nurtured, grew up in his house, father obviously who is in love with his child, and to the point that it's obvious, obviously has worn on him and the mom. To the very point, we don't even know if the mom and the dad are still together because of the strain that this type of thing has placed on their relationship or their home or how devastating this may have been to the other children or the sibling of this boy. Or even the community in which they live and the amount of embarrassment that is brought to this union. Now, now the father, in desperation, tries the last thing that he can do is by going to what the source of what he think he can get relief from. So the Bible tells us, and the Bible tells us in verse 17, and it says, One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I had brought unto thee my son, which have a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he take of him, he turb him and foam with, and gnash it with the teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And they could not. What a sad commentary. When someone is brought to the household of faith, to the leadership, those who have a relationship with the Lord, those who profess to have a relationship with the Lord, those who sit at his feet and hear the very things from his mouth directly into their ears. But yet, they are still powerless to enact change in the individual's spirit. How often and how many times do people come to our places of worship and come in with devastating situations and leave out the very way that they came? That's a sila moment. That, in essence, my brothers and sisters, is an indictment on our true relationship with the Lord. If we are walking in the fullness of his strength and his might and of his power and of his authority, and we fast and we pray the way that we say we do, we should have power to set free in the name of Jesus Christ. The question truly is. Through all of our titles. Through all of our ministry accessories. The robes and the garb that we wear. And, and the prestige. And the, and the respect that it wills and, and renders. Are we really as powerful. As the Lord intended for us to be. Or are we just. Playing church for the most part. For as many as are called, they are called to be sons in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The Bible says this in Romans many the eighth as chapter. are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. It also says that the earnest expectation of creation is waiting for the manifestation. Of the sons of God. If we are going to be crisis interventors. 
intervening in the lives of God's people, then we must come to know the Jesus of the intervention. And he says here, and he saith unto him, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Is it that we're bringing people to the wrong source? We're bringing them to our churches. We're bringing them to our programs. We're bringing them to our desire and ambitious goals to grow our ministries for popularity's sake. Are we the ones that have put ourselves in an exalted position that we have become the faithless generation of believers that are unbelieving to believe God, to deliver, to save, and to set free. And to give us power over every demon, every devil, every fallen angel, and every spirit that is unlike God. To bring them by the name of Jesus Christ into subjection and releasing the power of our Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah, Jesus. Releasing them in the power of the almighty God. He goes on to say to them, how long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. The Lord wants us to stop our focus. Stop. It's not about you, man or woman of God. It's not about your church. It's not about how long your church has been in operation. It's not about how gifted you are to teach and to preach and how knowledgeable you are or your educational background or your various degrees. And I have nothing against a person who has educated themselves. But the thing is this, when we bring people to us and not to Jesus the Christ, who has the power to set free, then we are only building a social club and not the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We're only building a religious social club and not the kingdom of Jesus Christ. When we become servants to serve the kingdom and we acknowledge that it's not about us, it's not of any good thing that we have done unless it be a works that any man should boast, but it's about Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God who has absolute power and authority to deliver, to rescue, and to set one free. To rescue and deliver and set him free. And notice verse 30, 20. It says, And they brought him unto him. And they brought him unto him. They brought the demonic boy that needed intervention to the interventor. To Jesus the Christ. We stated very off early that the scriptures say that all power and all authority was given to Jesus Christ. And before he left the scene, he said these very words to his disciples. All power, all power and all authority that is in heaven and earth. Now I'm giving it unto you. What have we done with the power to bring men 
unto Jesus the Christ. What have we done with the power to bring men unto Jesus the Christ? And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tarry. Whenever you bring, hallelujah, Jesus, the problem, the situation, the possessed, the challenge to Jesus, there is going to be an upsetting, hallelujah, Jesus, in the spirit realm. Yes, I know you said, don't rejoice over that, apostle. But yet, you see, when they brought him to Jesus, there was some agitation of the situation to the very point that this spirit now is acting out. Rejoice in the Lord God Almighty and in the power of his might. You see that when he comes with all power and authority, he aggravates. Hallelujah, Jesus. He aggravates the situation. And in anything that has not received movement, has chased, has stayed the same, you want to see the agitation of the Holy Spirit of God. That agitation lets you know. <laughs> that means something is about to change dynamically and it will never be the same again. <laughs> That means when God is on the scene, every foul, every demonic, every spirit that has captivated and has possessed is going to feel the nearness and the closeness the power and the authority that is in the name of Jesus Christ, and they cannot withstand holy agitation. When the holy has stepped into the realm of the unholy, captivating, frustrating, manipulating, controlling, destroying, diminishing, crippling and ultimately attempting to destroy all of that comes to a halt and although you see an acting out and, and they brought him unto him and when he saw him straightway the spirit tear him and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming and he asked his father notice jesus did not address it immediately because the very thing that the devil is trying to do to tear him, to wallow him, to destroy him, Jesus will not allow it to happen. Don't think that this was a distraction, that he didn't cut to the chase. Jesus understands who he is and the power that he wields. And he doesn't even have to address it immediately because the situation came into check. Immediately the demon shows him who he really is. Shows him that he has power, that he has authority, and he also shows himself that who I am, I am a demon possessing this boy. And Jesus asks a question, and he asks his father, how long is it ago since this came upon him? And he said of a child, and the father goes on to say, and oftentimes it have cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Where is our belief in Jesus Christ in the present day? Elevated 
faith has to do with an elevated mindset. An ability to look at every challenge that crosses our path in life. To say to it, you have no power. And you have no authority here. I feel when I invoke the name of Jesus Christ. I feel how agitated you become, Satan. But that lets me know, hallelujah, Jesus. That God is about to move. And when Jesus saw the people come running towards, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and went him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. Jesus took him out of hand and lifted him up, and, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast them out? And we'll talk about that later. But when Jesus took him by the hand, the spirit came out. He arose. He rebuked him, the deaf and dumb spirit. He charged him to come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him and came out out of him many times we see that spirit and folk but are too afraid to deal with it God is calling the body of Christ to consecration fasting cleansing confession of our weaknesses our frailties our flaws our powerlessness and come into a place with him that we confess our faults before him based upon 2 Chronicles the 7th chapter if my people will call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways the Bible lets us know that he would hear from heaven. He would forgive us and heal our land. People of God, the power of God is looking to return amongst us. But we must be willing to allow it. There are so many people in crisis mode. After ministering to people, I listen intently, extremely intently, to what they say and what they do. And oftentimes, after listening, God reveals to me where they are. And after that, I begin to pray and I wait for the Spirit of the Lord to speak. And when he speaks, he often provides instructions. He provides words and things that I need to share with them that leads them on a track of being set free. This is not a unique thing to one individual. This is not a unique thing to a group of specific individuals. This is the thing that God wishes to do throughout the entire body cries the entire body of christ and as an apostle of the lord jesus christ who has been called by him to that and i don't take that lightly but i call you into position into authority and into power because the scriptures say that behold right now we are seated in heavenly places, we are seated right now in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And if you're there today and you've heard the word of the Lord, God would have you to know he wants you to walk in power and in authority and nothing that comes up against you 
will be able to contend with you when you walk in the purpose and the destiny and the design of your ministry. This is Apostle William Whitfield saying, I love you in the Lord. Walk in the kingdom's authority and power. God bless you, and we'll see you back here on next week. <laughs>